I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the New America Foundation to this to this uh, policy forum, which we, we, we call Google Unwired. My name is Michael Calabrese. I'm the director of the wire, Wireless Future Program at the New America Foundation. Uh, Larry, is, as everyone knows, is the co-founder and first CEO of Google, a job that he, uh, I think, uh, wisely passed along uh, to uh, Eric Schmidt, who is, uh, will become the chairman of the board of New America Foundation in, in just a couple weeks, actually. Uh, in less than a decade, Google has gone a long way toward achieving uh, the rather modest goal that Larry and Sergey Breen set out as graduate students at Stanford, and that is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Larry is here today to talk about uh, an equally ambitious goal of his that also happens to be central to the mission of our program at New America, and that is pervasive connectivity to make the internet itself accessible and affordable anywhere and anytime through ubiquitous broadband networks. He's in Washington to meet with FCC commissioners and congressmen and to tell them and you today that to realize that vision we need to change the way we allocate and manage our nation's public airwaves. Now, all of you probably, I see some people here with laptops, you know, you're probably using Wi-Fi. I mean, how many people have used Wi-Fi? I assume it's everybody. How many people use it, you know, once, at least once a week? So it's a very, very large number. At the, the history of that spectrum actually is that everybody thought it was useless because it's used for microwave ovens. And you know, occasionally you close your microwave oven door too hard or something like that. It's a little bit dented. And your microwave oven actually leaks. Uh, and it leaks at 2.4 gigahertz, uh, which is the 2.4 megahertz, which is the, uh, or gigahertz, sorry, uh, which is the frequency that Wi Fi uses. And so basically, everybody thought that was worthless. And so it became unlicensed spectrum. And amazingly, you know, we had some brilliant engineers figure out how to use it to send huge amounts of data reliably for computers. Now, that's probably the standard use now of that frequency. I think that shows the value to the world of having this unlicensed regime. You know, people's creativity is amazing. Uh, the, the march of computers and electrical engineering and all this radio engineering uh, has been quite incredible. And the use that we can make of the spectrum when we have a you know open to innovation and so on is it's quite amazing and you can see that already with Wi-Fi. Now I think you know since 2001 the U.S. has gone from about uh, third third uh, in broadband penetration to 16th, um, which is kind of I think a real a travesty for a country as rich as ours. Um, and I think white spaces, the television white space, has a real potential to help that. Um, I like to think of it as Wi-Fi on steroids. Uh, if you think about Wi-Fi right now, you know, it has pretty limited range. Uh, you know, a lot of times, like I was in my hotel last night, I could get Wi-Fi, uh, but they go into a lot of trouble to install it in the hotel and make it work and so on. They probably need an access point, you know, many, many per floor to come into the hotel. <laughs> if we use TV white spaces for that same thing, you know, we could probably do it much, much more cheaply still with high data rates and high connectivity. And that, that would make a huge difference. You would see it in a lot more places. And that alone, I think, is, is enough reason to do, to do something like this. Uh, I think it will make a huge difference to everybody. But I think the other thing is that, uh, especially in like a rural area or something like that, uh, you can really get a lot more range with the, the 700 megahertz kind of bands we're talking about for TV white spaces. That would make a huge difference to those you know, imagine you're, you're kind of living in the middle of nowhere and your neighbor gets internet. They live three miles away or something. But, you know, Wi-Fi is pretty difficult. You have to set up a dish. That's what people do now. With uh, TV white space, you could probably just put up a normal antenna and, you know, help your neighbor out and give them connectivity. And those kind of things are really important. And by the way, the cost would be similar. There's no, like, increase in cost for that. You'll just have greater range. One is, you know, we've been involved a little bit in municipal Wi-Fi. We actually, you know, we operate a network in Mountain View, California. <coughs> you know, it has something like 40,000 users. It's pretty significant compared to the size of the city. You know, a very large number of people actually use it in the city. Um, I think 
So right, we've had some experience with that. And I think that'll make things like that much, much easier uh, as an example. So, you know, the amount of radios that you need to cover a city will go down dramatically uh, with the spectrum. That'll make it much more practical to do it. Um, and I also think you'll see devices that can talk to each other. You know, why can't your cell phone talk to another cell phone? You know, when you're, if you're both in the woods, you know, why can't you dial your friend or your family member? Right? That's really dumb. The, actually, it's a minor, you know, minor change to the software on the phone to allow it to do that. The reason why that doesn't work is because those things are designed primarily you know, to do billing and go through the centralized thing uh, rather than just provide communications. There's no technical reason why you can't do that. And I'd actually really like to see a, a sort of a communication cell phone system that was designed you know, to survive disasters and to be resilient and to operate even if there are no base stations. It's possible to do that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, you know, if you turn your TV, like there's an awful lot of empty channels in any given place, and uh, you know, that, that are actually good reasons for that. But uh, in any case, uh, you know, it's not that you know those empty channels change every day, right? I mean, you know which ones are empty, and they stay empty for a long time. And you know, if you have a device that hasn't moved much, uh, you know, it's not that hard to tell which ones are empty. So we actually proposed a pretty simple scheme, which is just that the devices know roughly where they are in the world, uh, called geolocation. And based on that, they have a database of all the channels and where they get it over the internet. And uh, that makes sure, you know, no matter what, if you know where the device is and you know where the channels are around that, we maintain a database of that. There's no way for it to broadcast on a, uh, on a used channel. Of course, this microphone here has no such uh, does the same thing and has no such technology. So it's obviously much more dangerous and we shouldn't allow them. But we do, there's millions of them. Uh, but we propose that as a pretty, I think, a pretty completely fail-safe way of doing it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of support for that in the coalition. And I, I think the, uh, you know, and that's, that's a very easy and very practical way to do it that's totally understandable. Before any device can actually be shipped, you know, like your Blackberry or something like that, it's thoroughly tested by the FCC and shown to cause no interference. And that would be true for white space devices too. And obviously, you know, if you're gonna invest a lot in building a device, you wanna actually know that you can produce it, that there are rules that let you produce that. And I'm totally confident that, you know, if we have rules that say, you know, you can use the spectrum under conditions that you cause no interference, that so those devices will get produced. And in fact, hundreds of millions of dollars will be invested in making those devices non-interfering, rather than the five or so people we have working on it now. You know, I, I, part of why I'm here is I just, I don't want people to be misled by, you know, people who have interests in this to, you know, cause the country to do the wrong thing. That really bothers me. So I'm here kind of to take a stand on that and say, you know, should you really be listening to the NAB, which, you know, wants to keep the spectrum for its own use, has all these other interests, they obviously have a reason to, to be pushing that agenda.